Hello everybody, my name is Sally Mewis. I head up Pern, the technology and digital group at Walker Morris. We are continuing um, our series of webinars focused on technology and digital issues with one today on international data transfers, post SHREMS and post exit. Um, welcome back to those of you who have joined all of our sessions so far. I hope you find this one useful and informative. Um, I'm delighted to be enjoy, uh, joined by Christian Brindell. He is uh, a data protection expert working in our regulatory team and knows all things concerning uh, GDPR and data generally. But this morning is going to be focusing on a conversation around data transfers. We decided to um, run this session because we were starting to get quite a lot of queries, not surprisingly, from people who were getting a bit confused about what was happening um, around data transfers, particularly after the Schrems case, which we're going to talk about a little bit uh, later on in the session, but also around Brexit, case law, guidance, new law, all of it starts to be very confusing. And of course, in this world where there is increased focus on global technology provision, I mean, most businesses are engaged with some US IT provider, even if it's at a basic level. Um, I think clients are starting, clients and businesses are starting to wondering just how they kind of find their way through the mayhem and maze that, that is uh, international data transfer law at the moment. So we thought it'd be really helpful if we just kind of went back to basics and set out where we are. And, and, and I think, I don't want to do a spoiler alert on this, but it, but it is quite a confusing picture. Um, but I think, but we can give you some practical tips at the end about what we think are sensible things to do now without going completely over the top and, and spending your entire life looking at um, data transfers. Now, before we get into the law, the data protection law around data transfers, I thought it would be really useful if Christian just gave us an overview of what we are dealing with now in terms of law post Brexit. Because I know there's been a couple of conversations we've had, Christian, where I've said to you, what, what's the new definition of data protection legislation? I'm so confused with all of these withdrawal acts and new data protection regulations. Did you want to start by just setting the scene, Christian, and, and just talking to us about what are we dealing now with in terms of law that relates to the processing of personal um, data? Yeah, sure. So a lot of people know we've had the EU GDPR uh, since 25th of May 2018. And then from January of this year, we now have our very own EU GDPR. Um, but there are questions about what that actually means. Uh, and in particular, a lot of people have been asking questions about what, how do I actually define the UK GDPR? Is there a definition somewhere hidden in the legislation? Well, actually, there is. I've got it up on the screen here. So this comes out you um, to implement the exit regulations and so here we've got a rather lengthy definition of what the UK GDPR actually is uh, so if you've been practicing your head thinking about you know how do I put this into a contract how do I define applicable law data protection legislation this is effectively your, your new yeah. definition for purposes of the UK GDPR that's really helpful. And it's more complicated than there just being a new piece of legislation, isn't there, Christian? Because we've got um, different aspects that apply to different areas of processing of personal data. And again, I think it, even though this isn't necessarily focused on international transfers, I think it's just really helpful to try to put this in context. It was already a little bit complicated before Brexit because you obviously had EU GDPR, um, the regulation, but you also have the Data Protection Act 2018, which added on some layers around some areas that weren't covered by uh, GDPR. What, what's the position now, Christian, in terms of the various elements and how they fit together? Yeah, so effectively, I think most businesses now are going to be looking at complying with the EU GDPR to some extent and also the UK GDPR. So when it comes to uh, your legacy data, so that's data that you've collected between implementation of the EU GDPR and implementation of the UK GDPR, so within that effectively kind of two-year period, um, that legacy data is still subject to the EU GDPR. So to the extent you're still processing that data, you still have to comply with the EU GDPR. All of your new data that you're collecting in the UK will be subject to UK GDPR. Uh, I think this gets more complex for international organisations because you know what you're effectively looking at is 
whether you're captured by the EU GDPR for your current activities. So if you've got an establishment in the EU and you're processing data in the context of the activities of that establishment, or if you're based in the UK, but you're mm -hmm. people in the EU with goods and services, then you're still subject to the EU GDPR to the extent mm -hmm. you conduct those activities. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you're based entirely in the UK, your goods and services are only focused at UK citizens, UK residents, you're not providing goods and services in the EU, you don't have an establishment there, then your data yeah. activities will be governed exclusively uh, by the UK GDPR from now on. Um, but with respect to both, you're still going to have this aspect of DPA, what I call DPA dovetailing. So you're still looking at regulatory provisions and then cross-referencing them against the provisions in DPA. So I think a good example of that would probably be in criminal conviction data processing, where yeah. you've got co obligation in the GDPR, but then you're still dealing with those Schedule 1 conditions in DPA. Yeah. And, and then you've got the Keeling schedules, haven't you, which I think are quite a useful resource, aren't they, Christian? Because you can just Google Keeling, can't you? And it pulls up the amendments that have been made to the European GDPR to show how it now applies in the UK. Absolutely. There's a Keeling schedule for the DPA and the GDPR. So if you want to go in and have a look and see what changes have been made by the various different instruments and exit regulations, then that really is the best place because you can see all yeah. the variations that have been made. And it's fair to say that there's not really many, it's just cutting out references to Europe, isn't it? I think that's for the most part, I think that's right. I mean, obviously, references to member state law have been removed, but in terms of the expansive law, that, that really is the same yeah. for the time being. Yeah, no, it's really helpful. And I think that just sets the scene in terms of, of what we're dealing with and the different aspects of the law. Let's move back now and focus on international data transfers. Um, we've got this slide here which shows where the law is in GDPR that relates to the various elements of uh, international data transfers. But can you just remind us, Christian, of what we mean by an international data transfer? Because again, I still think this is confusing for some clients in terms of what it covers, because it potentially has a broader application than you might think, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I mean, I think, yeah, you've got more obvious the data transfers so maybe you're sending an email attachment or a zip file um, to a recipient base in another jurisdiction and clearly there is you know some some obvious transfer aspect to that um but i think you know as you mentioned at the beginning given the advent of technology and some of the different tools that business is using now um it's quite common for there to be a, a data repository or a conduit in another jurisdiction i think as long as you've got data passing through that to a recipient, you arguably still got a transfer relationship with that ultimate recipient, even though there's a, a third party intermediary in the middle. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, um, from a tech perspective and, and looking at lots of sort of software licensing and tech agreements, a very common scenario in that world is that you are using a supplier, Salesforce, Oracle, one of, one of those Microsoft Azure or any of those really, um, and they are based in a US or in another jurisdiction, and they're not necessarily transferring the data, they are just providing maybe second level support services. And, and that is captured, I think, by this transfer, isn't it? And, and therefore, understanding in those sorts of agreements what's actually going on there and how that data is being accessed, is it being downloaded to a local server, etc is quite an important um, thing to understand in terms of those contracts, isn't it, Christian? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not always, you know, always as straightforward as you think it might be. Yeah, and, and, and I think it's become even more important because of the landscape that we now find ourselves in in relation to international data transfers to really understand what is going on with some of, some of those suppliers. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And just going on now to this sort of transfer mechanisms, we've got um, certain lawful m ways of transferring data internationally, haven't we, Christian? Do you want to just talk us through those at a high level and we'll come back and look at them in a bit more detail in a moment? Sure. So uh, the approach the GDPR takes is you, you've kind of got this gen general print of transfers that has to comply with the specific conditions of the regulation. And as you said, we've got 
um, a number of different specific transfer mechanisms that you can rely on um, to comply with the regulations. So um, adequacy decisions have been a key player. Um, derogations, situations, we'll talk a bit more about how those work. And then appropriate safeguards, you know, a lot of people recognise those as the standard contractual clauses, uh, which we'll also talk about a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on to the appropriate safeguards. Oh, sorry. Um, and looking first of all, I'm having slight trouble with my slides actually. So looking first of all at adequacy decisions. So on the left here, we've got um, a list of countries uh, that have found to be adequate by the European uh, Union. And that means, of course, that data can be transferred safely to those countries without additional requirements beyond the usual processor clauses. Um, now, you'll notice that the United States is not on there, but for that, for the United States, we've had safe harbour and we've also had um, the privacy shield. We're not on there either, are we, uh, Christian? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be seeing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the derogations? Yeah, so the, the derogations, I mean, they're, they're, they can accommodate a set of transfers, but they're not really designed for routine data sharing. It's more, more kind of one-off instant um, data transfers. So, I mean, a good example for the, the eagle-eyed viewers um, who might have seen the ICO recently published uh, a letter demonstrating their analysis data transfers to the SEC in the United States for those regulated entities that are based in the UK but have to transmit data to the US. And so the ICO has looked at this and thought actually we're comfortable that necessary based on public interest. Um, so that's a good example of how these derogations come into play. They're designed for you know routine regular data sharing um, but they can be useful for those types of one-off instances. Yeah, another one that I often have people pointing out to me is the contract one, the second bullet saying, oh great, we don't need we don't need to worry because there's a derogation of the contract. That's a quite limited application, isn't it, Christian? It's a bit of a red herring because yeah. often you don't have the contract with the with the data subject, that's the problem. So, so I think it's fair to say, isn't it, in summary, that in the world of business, these derogations have, have limited application, um, I think, in terms of just normal day-to-day -day business transfers. I think that's fair. Whenever you've got a you know, routine data sharing relationship, this is not a solution for you. No. So on, the, on this slide, really, we're looking at adequacy, ad adequacy decisions. Has the country been found to be adequate? Um, and really ignoring, I think, for all intents and purposes, derogations. So then we've got um, other mechanisms for lawful transfers, uh, binding corporate rules. Just tell us a little bit about binding corporate rules, because again, just in sort of day to day commercial contracts, although I have had where they were relevant, they don't seem to be that relevant. Do you want to just talk us through that one, Christian? Yeah, the so binding corporate rules are really a method of intra-group data sharing. Um, so it's really been used by large organizations that need to shift data across jurisdictional lines. And that's why you, know, you tend to see it. it's the big names. Um, there's yeah. a name on that list that stands out in particular given current events. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a straightforward process. You know, you're looking at potentially a couple of years, a reasonable amount of cost, interaction with supervisory authorities in order to get those rules in place. Um, so it's not something that we've seen being used by many organisations. Um, it really has been reserved to those kind of large, larger behemoths um, that are out there. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I've, again, on a few tech deals that I've done, I've had suppliers saying to me, oh, you don't need to worry about any international data transfers because we've got binding corporate rules in place. Um, and in some cases, those suppliers have been quite insistent that even that, that their binding corporate rule regime um, applies to third party subcontractors or sub processes, i.e. people who are not in their group. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Christian? Do you have to treat those scenarios with a little bit of care? I think you always have to exercise a bit of care with binding corporate rules because there does still appear to be a reasonable amount of misunderstanding about how they work. I mean, probably similar to yourself. I've also been told when I've been dealing 
well, we've got binding corporate rules in the back because we've got an internal policy document that, that says that we do. And, and that really is just not works. And it's a very formal process that has to be adhered to. Um, so always a bit edgy, I think. And then the firm favourite. So, so this is the one that we kind of stick to, don't we? The standard uh, contractual clauses. Um, and I think this is probably, again, the main mechanism that people use for lawful transfers outside the EEA. Just talk us again through how they work, Christian, and, and what's involved in getting those executed. Sure. So if you're transmitting to a recipient that doesn't have the benefit of adequacy and it's not an introduced transfer that's covered by banning corporate rules, this is really your only way of making it work. Um, now, what these are designed to do is because the recipient jurisdiction doesn't have an adequacy determination, the contractual clauses, in a sense, are designed to kind of replicate the regulatory environment in the exporter's jurisdiction so that you've got contractual protections covering the data once it lands in the destination jurisdiction. Um, we've had uh, two forms of control to controller clauses um, and you've only got one form of control to processor clauses that you can use now. Um, I mean these have been used widely for, for a period of years now but throughout that whole period we've always had the same holes in the regulatory framework so you know, a lot of people be aware we've never had processor to processor standard contractual clauses which is yeah. difficult to get inventive you know in the way that they it. Um, so it's a solution but but not in every case perhaps yeah absolutely and and i think we were sort of reasonably comfortable with this position right where we've got adequacy decisions which in some cases helped us if you were transferring to a country that, that had a finding of adequacy. You've got BCRs, which is, as we've said, limited, but good for intergroup transfers. And then the one area that most people, as you say, were using were SCC, standard contractual clauses. And that was kind of the backbone, really, of international data transfers in a business context. Um, and, and we also have Privacy Shield. So I think everybody kind of understood the limitations of some of these mechanisms, because sometimes certainly with the SECs, you felt like you were trying to kind of manipulate them to suit a situation because they're not, they're not very flexible. You clearly can't make changes to them. Um, but we have that and the combination of privacy shield for transfers to the USA. So it was kind of happy days. And then um, this guy shows up, doesn't he? And changes changes everything and throws a spanner in the works, as if you like. Do you want to just, I mean, we, we don't need to go over this in too much detail, Christine, but I think it's quite an interesting story about why this guy has uh, ended up causing us some consternation in terms of how we do international data transfers. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's a fascinating story. It's a real kind of David versus Goliath tale. Uh, and this is the man of the hour, it's Max Schrems. He's a, an Austrian privacy enthusiast and law graduate from, from Salzburg in Austria. Um, and the story goes that he was in the States for a period of time in connection with his law school studies. And he saw a presentation by a representative of Facebook um, and was less than impressed with the comments this individual made about the privacy laws and you know, the expectation they should comply with them. And so when he came back, he was doing his dissertation and for the substance of his dissertation, he submitted a data subjects access request to Facebook, uh, to Facebook Island, which was the, the EU entity that then transmitted data back to the States. And so that's how we ended up with this being litigated in Ireland. Um, so he originally made a complaint to the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, really struggled to gain any traction. Um, then, you know, a couple of years later, I and mean, this is going back a decade now, uh, in 2013, we had the Edward Snowden leaks, which provided, you know, documentary evidence of US surveillance activities. And so with this, with, the, you know, with this ammunition, he went back and said, actually, I, you know, I've got proof now. Uh, and for all, any conspiracy theorists or surveillance people that are uh, watching this, I've got a couple of really interesting numbers for you. So um, a couple of different surveillance schemes that the US government operates. There's, there's one called PRISM. Uh, and another one called Upstream. Now, the PRISM scheme itself harvested over 250 million communications relating to foreign nationals in 2011 alone. Uh, 2015, we've got 95,000 ish um, individual people being subject to surveillance by the US government. Uh, for Upstream, since 2011, you know, you're looking at 
the guts of 27 million communications being intercepted and, and reviewed by the US government. Um, so some would say he had a legitimate argument that you know, this wasn't entirely correct. Um, so he came back, um, managed to defeat Safe Harbor, which was, as you said, then replaced with Privacy Shield. Um, really not much has changed in terms of US surveillance gathering activity. So he's come back for a second, second bite of the apple and has managed to defeat Privacy Shield as well. So for those circa five and a half thousand organizations based in the US that had self-certified and were relying on the field, that is now all gone, no longer a possibility for transfers to the US. Uh, so it is an amazing story, but perhaps the most amazing part of all of it is that he's, he's still a Facebook user. <laughs> he's still a Facebook user. <laughs> so he's not that he's not that of such a person. And so, so obviously as a result of this, we were kind of left with relying on standard contractual clauses, weren't we, as, as a result of the fallout from Schrems. But you know, what happened, of course, is that um privacy shield was no longer val valid. Um and just talking a little bit about how we deal then with standard contractual clauses, Christian, what What's the situation there in the context of Privacy Shield? So if you had a relationship with an organization in the US that had previously relied on Privacy Shield so to receive data from the EEA, um, that can no longer happen. And so really, your only solution for that relationship to continue is to execute standard contractual clauses. Um, now, another aspect of the Schrems decision related to transfer risk assessments and so not only do you have to now execute those standard contractual clauses, but you've also got this kind of additional compliance piece to think about um, where you actually have to think about assessing the risk of the transfer, the types of data that are being transmitted, the risk they might be intercepted and subjected to surveillance. Um, so a couple of new requirements stemming from, from that decision by the CJEU. Yeah, and I think that was the surprising thing in many ways, wasn't it? That, that, that this decision actually called into question the adequacy of, of SCCs on their own without additional due diligence requirements. Um, and that, that, I think, is the first area where it kind of left people feeling slightly unclear about how do, how do you get data to the United States? Um, and I think that's an ongoing kind of question that people have, isn't it, Christian? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that applies to, to the US, but, you know, if you've got data sharing relationships with organizations in yeah. countries um, where it's well known that there is state surveillance ongoing, so people might be thinking, you know, your China's, your Russia's of the world, um, then, you know, you've got the same issue in terms of how you address the risk of making those transfers. And then, of course, following on from this, and I guess, um, Maybe, I guess on the back of what was going on with Schrems, we got this additional guidance from the EDPB. Talk, talk us through what that says and, and kind of the implications of that for, for us. Yeah, so the, the draft guidance looked to impose a really high bar on, on data controllers. So the onus was really on the exporter to assess the initial transfer and then any onward transfers and there seems to be this suggestion that actually as the responsible exporting controller you should be looking at each one of those jurisdictions assessing their privacy laws their data protection laws considering whether you know the data that you're sending could feasibly be subject to state surveillance and i think you know the reality of that for organizations is how do you possibly achieve that i mean even just taking you know taking away the language barrier you know, there are very few organizations out there that have a dedicated resource in terms of an internal legal team that can sit down and start looking at you know yeah. um, legal systems in other countries trying to understand how this all works i mean very very high bar for data exporters yeah and so and and we would have been left wouldn't we in a situation if those eu recommendations were adopted with, with with this sort of set of scenarios that are on this slide. Again, do you want to just talk us through what that might have meant in a bit more detail for, for uh, UK business? Yeah, so th there was this this piece around having a 12 month grace period. So um, you didn't have to modify your agreements for up to 12 months potentially, but then 
certainly after that period, the expectation was that you would revisit those agreements, you would reassess the relationships that you've got, um, and some of the particular measures that they suggested should be taken into account. You, know, you should be able to map all of your data transfers, including onward transfer your data sub-processes. You've got your risk assessments, but then also you should be looking at and considering whether you can include additional contractual measures, you know, potentially additional security measures like encryption, um, just to protect that data flow uh, on its way to the recipient jurisdiction. Um, no, no real kind of guidance on exactly how that should be achieved. You know, really, that onus was was put on the data export. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is really complex, isn't it? Because it, there was also suggestion in this Schrems case that, you know, if you were going to be sending data to a country like the United States, where there were sweeping government powers to seize data, um, that you shouldn't really be doing that. Uh, but, but where, you know, that's a very difficult situation for businesses that are relying heavily on US tech providers, for example. I know I keep bringing this back to tech providers in the US, but that's my world and that's kind of what I understand. That becomes really challenging, isn't it? Because you're almost asking somebody to change their whole business model if they can't get the necessary protections in a particular state in the United States that the, that the local um, government or the federal government won't start looking at their data. And that's not possible to achieve, is it? So, you know, it creates a real challenge this, doesn't it, for business? That's right. I mean, it, it didn't seem entirely re realistic in some ways. And I think, you know, uh, some people would also have been wondering, would this actually have a disproportionate effect on the UK? And obviously, we've got the Atlantic Data Corridor, the relationship between the UK and the US when it comes to e-commerce is enormous. And so, you know, the financial implications on the economy, if we weren't able to transfer data to the US, you know, full stop, I think there's yeah. an argument that that would have affected the UK more than the block financially. And I think the data mapping for all transfers, including onward transfers, you know, again, if you're dealing with a large a large tech provider in the US has got very complex subcontractors, subprocessor models, you know, you as a controller exporter trying to map that uh, is, is, a, is a massive challenge, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you potentially, you know, you know what it's like when you see these lists of subprocessors. You know, you're yeah. looking at, you know, a dozen different subprocessors in different jurisdictions. Some of them might be part of the same group, but some of them won't. Um, so having a global picture of what that looks like and then trying to tie it in with the various different legal regimes is a, yeah, a real challenge. No, exactly. But so, so we we're kind of waiting, weren't we, with trepidation? You know, we, we've got the Schrems decision, and of course, the Schrems decision does bind us, does bind UK business. Um, and that was throwing a question mark on whether SCCs were effective in all cases and what you needed to do to check out the country to which the data was being exported. Then we had this guidance from the EU, which was equally scary, dare I say. <laughs> And what did our ICO then come back and say? So we were kind of waiting, weren't we? Basically, breath saying, "All right, we, we we know this is really a tricky situation. It's kind of uncertain. What is our regulator going to say?" And you know, to be fair to our regulator, she's had the reputation of being very practical and very pragmatic in all of these things. She's not kind of a business. She's not trying to do things that affect business. She's trying to enable business. So it was quite interesting, wasn't it, Christian? Waiting for her. Um, announcement on, on where we are following the case and of course the EDPB guidance and, and what did she say what did that tell us not much well, <laughs> no, not much at all unfortunately I think we were all sort of really hoping for a clear definitive statement from the ICO you know are we going to be adopting this guidance are we going to be adopting new standard contractual clauses proposed by the EU by the European Commission um, but actually, this, this is what we got. You know, this is an excerpt from what was published on the ICA website at the time. As you say, it's, it's not enormously helpful. I think we can probably all agree on that. But she has made subsequent comments, hasn't she, that I think are more helpful in terms of what you should be doing as a business if you're transferring internationally and trying to use SCC. What, what, what's the update to that, Christian? Yeah, so as far as I'm aware, this hasn't been made publicly available on the website, but we both had the pleasure of joining an ICO session um, where we were talking about, you know, what's going to happen with guidance with these new SCCs. 
Now, the representative of the ICO that was in that session, uh, what they said was that EDPB guidance, the draft guidance, would not be adopted by the UK, even if it was approved at EU level before Brexit date. Um, so we're not taking EDPB guidance, whether there's a financial motivation for that, like we just talked about, who knows. Um, the FCCs, slightly different. The ICO said if they're approved, you know, recognising there are issues with the FCCs, they are inflexible. If they're approved before Brexit date, then the UK can take them. If they're not, then we won't. Um, as far as I'm aware, they were not approved before Brexit date. And so the way it looks right now is that we're not taking the new FCCs or the draft guidance. No, but it's likely, isn't it, that our regulator will publish their own guidance at some point. And I think, it, is it reasonably likely that we will adopt new FCCs maybe that are similar to the European ones? I mean, if that that's my, I mean, we don't know, do we? But that's my sense that we may at some point do that. Although they've been talking about that for many years, haven't they? <laughs> they have. I mean, I, I'm with you on that. I think we will see some UK standard contractual clauses. I mean, there's a bit of tension there because on the one hand, it, of course, now in, in Brexit, Britain, it, it doesn't really make sense for us to be relying on EC approved documentation. So on the one hand, it makes perfect sense for us to have our own standard contractual clauses. But then on the other hand, we've got this ongoing relationship with the EU. Of course, we want to have adequacy. And so a full scale departure from that maybe wouldn't be advisable. Um, yeah. But like you, I think we will see some UK specific SCCs. But the degree to which they will differ from the new model, I'm not sure there's going to be a, a tremendous amount of difference there. No, exactly. So do you want to just do a roundup of, we'll just pause, I think, Christian, and just kind of do a bit of a roundup of, of where we are generically across the whole data piece. And I think you, you've got this slide that you're going to talk to now just to pull some threads together. And then we'll go on and talk about specific transfers between the UK and the EE and the UK and the rest of the world and draw, draw together some of the threads of the thinking and the points that we've been making so far. Yeah, sure. Um, so where we've ended up um, as part of the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK uh, and the EU, we've got provisions dealing with telecoms and data protection. Now, as far as the data protection content goes, at the very heart, there is this concept of a domestic right to regulate. That will also apply to international transfer mechanisms. So from now on, um, international transfers will be assessed on the basis of the domestic law in the jurisdiction, which then paves the way for us to create our own standard contractual clauses like we just talked about. But then around that, we've got a number of uh, cooperation style commitments. Um, so the first one is to facilitate cross-border data flows and connected to that um, is a commitment that we won't introduce specific data localization requirements. So we won't say you have to store data in the UK um just to enable that free free flow of data across borders um we've got a statement on continuing data flow on direct marketing i think this is probably connected to the uk's position on the e-privacy regulations on pecr um, because the uk government have made clear for a period of time now that we will not be adopting the new e-privacy directive when it is finally agreed by the eu government that will ever happen. Um, so we've got a continuation of the status quo um, for a period of time. Then we've got um, some provisions on um, digital trade. We'll cooperate to ensure that digital trade has been inhibited. Um, in connection with that, there won't be um, prior authorization requirements on either side for electronic service providers. There also will be um, no question of tariffs on electronic transmissions. Um, and then yeah, ultimately moving forward, uh, whilst we do have cooperation in these specific areas, um, with the domestic rights regulate, we will have the ability to determine our own data protection and privacy laws in the future. Um, so that, that's kind of a roundup of where we ended up with the trade and cooperation agreements. Um, and I suppose the one thing that isn't on that slide, which we should say, is that as far as the relationship between the UK and the EU goes, we have been granted this temporary exemption from third country status. Um, so as I understand it, that's, that's four months. 
um, extended to six months unless one side objects. So that will continue on the 1st of July um, where you don't need to worry about having additional protections in place to receive data from the EEA. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that, that adequacy decision, that idea that we continue to have the same status that we had pre-Brexit uh, from, from the point of view of international data transfers is a really big point isn't it, for a lot of businesses, because if we do get adequacy status, then all of the additional issues around putting in place data transfer agreements kind of falls away, doesn't it, Christian? So it's going to be a big and important issue, I think, for us. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think that, you know, really that is the solution is for the UK to secure an adequate decision rather than just this kind of temporary interim arrangement. Now, I think, you know, a lot of people on might be saying, well, the UK government's been been really mm -hmm. fair. We've always said, you know, throughout the negotiation period that we would award the block, you know, kind of a global adequacy decision. So any country um, in the block can can receive data from the UK without any issues. Um, the EU's position has not been perhaps quite as amicable, uh, and they have been going backwards and forwards about whether the UK can be awarded adequacy. I think this is based, you know, in part on and states of those types of activities. Um, but I think, you know, to me, you know, given that the UK was kind of a leader in establishing and implementing GDPR, you know, I think a lot of us kind of see you know, the Brits and the, and the French as being sort of pioneers of data protection law in Europe would be somewhat bizarre if having done all of that, the EU would, would reach a decision that actually our data protection laws are not up to scratch and we can't be awarded adequately. I think we should be awarded. Hopefully, that will happen uh, in the next four months. I mean, at the moment, we don't really have. I mean, at one time, I was thinking that it was unlikely that we would be awarded it, and then and then the sort of wind changes, does not it? And you think, oh, maybe, maybe we will. What is there any sense at the moment? What might happen? I mean, obviously, probably all this stuff going on with vaccines recently hasn't maybe hasn't helped. Potentially not. I mean, I think I think you've got to take it all with a pinch of salt because. At the end of the day, it is a negotiation between two different parties. And if the UK government had come out and said, yeah, we will absolutely award you, you know, permanent adequacy decision, even if there's no reciprocity from you, um, clearly that would have affected our position, you know, in, in the negotiations. So uh, I think you kind of got to accept that there is a bit of that going on and hopefully um, it, it's more of a pawn or a real, a real issue. Well, and we'll wait to see and, and see what happens over the next few months when we maybe have some more clarity on it. Um, so I think, so just to summarise where we've got to, we've talked about the law now, we've talked about the challenges that the Schrems case and the abandonment of Privacy Shield has given us. We've talked about the uncertainty, I guess, that the case has left us with in terms of the adequacy of using standard contractual clauses for international data transfers and, and the potential other things that you might have to do and I think that is an area which still is a little bit vague but the potential other checks and balances that you ought to be taking when you're using SCCs. Um, we know that we're not necessarily going to adopt European data protection guidelines, we know we're not going to adopt the European SCCs um, but we're unclear how much of that will at some point be incorporated. So I think it's clear, isn't it, um, Christian, that you can still use SEC model clauses for your data transfers, and the ICO has said that's right, so that we, we're, not, we're not moving away from that. I guess what's unclear in my mind is just how far you have to go in addition to that to um, check out the adequacy of the local law, I guess, in the importing country. Yeah. Is that <laughs> where you are? And, and it's a little bit unsatisfactory, but you've probably almost got to do a little mini assessment on a case by case basis, haven't you? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, organisations are going to have to look at the value of individual contracts to uh, their yeah. business continuity. The ICO is still advising that for business continuity purposes, you should still implement standard contractual clauses within this kind of interim period. So that, that being the case, I think you know each individual business 
I have to look at you know, the relationships they've got in place, um, the role that they play in business continuity. If you've got a hugely valuable relationship with someone in the EU and you know, risk of that being interrupted it is really going to affect the business, then it makes sense that you should go ahead and execute those standard contractual clauses over the next few months just so if we're not awarded adequacy and there's no other interim arrangement that's concluded and at least you've got that that peace of mind that satisfaction that you're not going to have you know a tremendous upset to your business now if on the other hand you know you don't have any relationships that are that precious maybe you don't want to incur the time and the costs in, in going off and changing your perhaps maybe then you think actually we'll, we'll take the risk and we'll see how this plays out over the next couple of months it may be that we don't need to do anything anyway um, no. So, so just moving on again to draw this together, I think, I mean, you and I talked about this, haven't we, on a number of occasions, and it's it's good to think about this in two parts. So transfers to and from EEA um, and transfers to and from the rest of the world and UK. I think that's how you have to kind of think about it if you're a UK business. Do you want to just talk us through the different scenarios and, and what might work in each case and what you need to be thinking about there, Christian? Yeah, of course. Well, let's talk about the inbound aspect first. So we just touched on this um, as far as traffic from the EEA to the UK is concerned. We do have this sort of temporary exemption from third country status. So up until the 1st of July, technically you don't need to have any specific protections in place. However, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with adequacy when that period comes to an end. If we don't have adequacy, then you'll need standard contractual clauses to get the data from the EEA over to the UK. Um, as far as the rest of the world's concerned, you'd always be looking at local laws at origin. Um, then once it arrives in the UK and becomes subject to UK GDPR, then you've got to think about whether you've got any specific requirements in order to get the data back. There's yeah, always been this peculiarity with the EU GDPR that it applies to the processing of personal data, not necessarily the processing of EU origin personal data. And so there's always been this kind of strange technicality where you could be based in the US, send your data to the EU, don't need any protections, but then need additional safeguards in order to get your data back from the EU. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, on the outbound traffic, they're going the other way, transfers from the UK to the EEA, you know, we've been playing pretty fair, I think, in terms of how that works. I think we would like to just grant the EU um, a permanent adequ adequacy decision, and so there wouldn't be any additional measures needed um, for those transfers to continue. Um, dealing with the rest of the world, I guess what you're looking at here is those adequacy decisions. Um, the ones that have been made by the European Commission have been adopted by the UK. So that list of countries that we looked at earlier, they still have adequacy for purposes of UK law. So you can transmit data to those jurisdictions without any additional protections. Now, if you're looking at a jurisdiction that doesn't have adequacy, then you're kind of back to the framework that we've been talking about where you're needing to execute standard contractual clauses to make that work. Yeah, I think the the transfers backwards and forwards from EEA to UK, I think, are really interesting. Um, and this is a point I think that uh, wasn't really focused in by the ICO on the talk that you and I attended. Um, but it, it, where you are a controller in the UK and you send it to a processor in Europe, there's been some question marks about whether, and, and obviously on our understanding that can be done without an additional protection, but there's been some some talk about, well, can you actually lawfully then get that data back, even though the processor in Europe is processing it on your documented instructions and, and only as a data processor? And we've encountered that, haven't we, recently in a few contracts that we've been negotiating. And it seems to be just a point, it seems to be a significant point to me, but it seems to be a point that's being swept under the carpet. And really when people are talking about transfers between the EEA and the UK, they're talking about controllers in Europe transferring to programs um, in the UK, for which there are a set of model clauses. What, what do you think is going to happen there? Because I can see that as being slightly problematic if we don't get an adequacy decision. No, I mean, that's a good point, and you're quite right. In the session that we attended with the ICA, they perhaps deliberately did not address that that question. Um, I mean, I suppose, you know, maybe the solution is 
you know, looking at the new model clauses that the EU have produced, um, those clearly are capable of, of managing different relationships. It's not just control to control or control to processor anymore. You know, you, you've got more flexibility in how those work. They're kind of divided into different models so that you can combine the, the modules that you need to make it work. Um, so maybe that's that's part of the solution yeah. to our own sanitary clauses. And certainly, and certainly I thought I expected the, our regulator to say, oh, you don't need to worry about a transfer back from your, a European processor to a UK controller. But in fact, they, they haven't, she hasn't said that. She's, she's sort of keeping her powder dry on that one, I think, isn't she? So we, can expect, we can expect that there will be some challenges there. Okay, so let's just pull all these threads together in some final tips, really. Um, because, because as we've said, it, there is some uncertainty and there is some complexity, but I still think there are some sort of practical um, common sense things that you can do. Um, and I think it's, so, I mean, it's always been important to understand uh, data flows and where your data is going. And that that's not new, but it's even more important, it seems to me, that you focus on that as a business now and you do have some understanding of where that is, particularly where you're using uh, subcontractors in, in, in international countries. Uh, do you want to just talk us through the sort of practical steps that people should be doing now because we kind of know if there is going to be an adequacy decision, Christian? Yeah, so I think the first point is you, you have to map your data flows because otherwise, you know, without knowing where your data is going, which you're going to land in, you, know, you can't really start thinking about whether there are risks relevant to those relationships. Um, so I think the first point is always to map map your data flows. I think, you know, realistically, probably always was a requirement as part of your diligence. You know, um, I, realistically, in practice, what what we've seen for quite a long time is that when it comes to processes and onward transfers in particular, there isn't a huge amount of attention paid to that by, by some organizations. So, you know, maybe that's an area that could be improved upon and it, you know, it's more of a formal requirement now. So that's what we suggest that you would do. Um, once you've kind of mapped that out and you understand, you know, where your data is coming from, where it's going, then you can start thinking about, you know, which law applies to this. You know, are you subject to the EU law, the EU GDPR for some of the processing operations in the UK, GDPR for other processing operations. That's going to be likely for you know pretty much all international organisations, I think. So you've got a piece there thinking about right now we know where the data is going, what law actually applies to that, and that will have an impact on you know what safeguards you use, and particularly if the UK does develop its own standard contractual clauses, then you might end up with different standard contractual clauses applying to different data flows. Um, could get quite complicated. Um, assess your, your risks. Um, yeah, I think this, as we said, with the Schrems 2 decision being a decision by the Court of Justice of the European Union before Brexit Day, the binding decision on the UK, it could theoretically be opened by the UK Supreme Court. No, no rumblings of that yet. Um, so that looks like it is a formal requirement here to stay so your transfer risk assessment is something that you have to do and then you know picking you up on a couple of the points in the edpb guidance even though we know we're not going to be adopting that yeah you know, there is a piece around um can you improve security of transfers can you add technical safeguards such as encryption pseudonymization um are there contractual safeguards that you could add in so you know things like a notification obligation if a request is made by the agency to provide data. If new laws are introduced that could affect the security of data, you're going to let us know. You know maybe those are coupled with a termination right. Um, you know, there are potentially a few different things that you can do on the contractual side. And then Sorry, I was going to say it's interesting, isn't it, that the there was definitely commentary. I can't remember whether it was in the Schrems case or it was from the regulators saying that it is possible to change the standard contractual clauses because we've always grown up with this notion that you can't change a single word of them, otherwise you run the risk that um, it won't be a valid uh, lawful transfer. But that's not really the case now, and there's certainly a sense that you could add some of these additional contractual safeguards quite safely into your standard contractual clauses without falling foul of, of the mechanism. 
Yeah, that, I mean, that's right. Historically, I think I probably would have felt comfortable maybe adding in an indemnity or a confidentiality obligation, but otherwise, I thought a kind of real hesitation about making changes to the standard contractual clauses. Um, that does seem to have shifted a little bit now, and the suggestion that you can include more sort of ad hoc clauses, provided they don't undermine um, the data protection rights that are being covered by the agreement, you know, as long as it doesn't undermine that, doesn't counteract you know those other objectives then it seems like it's it's permissible yeah absolutely and and the point about can you anonymize data can you pseudonymize it all those techniques are important to consider aren't they and and even if you can't in a particular scenario christian it's really worth documenting that you've looked at that and assessed it so that if ever there is an issue you can show you thought about these things and you took all the appropriate you know as, as much of the appropriate measures that you were able to take in the circumstances uh, definitely i think you know, um probably like most regular lawyers uh, my advice would always be create a compliance record yeah. if you later down the line if you've got a record showing that you've actively you know you, you've addressed an issue you've identified it you've addressed it you've taken measures to try and deal with it you know virtually always you will get credit from the regulator for doing that so definitely and, always create a compliance record and, and ask the question about whether it's necessary for the data to be transferred because sometimes organizations just get into the habit of sending things i mean this goes to the whole principle of data minimization in, in gdpr anyway doesn't it but but this idea that businesses transfer data when maybe they don't need to you know because they've always done it or it's too hard not to take send the whole lot um, there's a whole piece there isn't there around can you know is it necessary to actually have this data being accessed internationally or not at all and I, and I think maybe businesses could do a bit more at looking at just that very basic point yeah I mean I think that's something that we encounter with clients reasonably frequently um yeah. actually you know the data that's being sent you know, maybe is not required to achieve the objective that's being pursued um and so as you say that ties in quite nicely with your other data protection obligations, data minimization, proportionality. You, know, you really only want to be processing data to the extent that it's necessary to achieve the objective at hand. Uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. If you can restrict the flow in some way and still achieve that objective, then definitely go ahead and do that. And I certainly think that, you know, again, moving it into the scenario of sort of commercial outsourcing tech tech agreements, uh, my, my world, a bit more my world than your world. You know, what, what I feel now is that this whole issue of where is data being sent? How are you going to make sure that it's sent lawfully? What are the challenges around that can no longer be kind of a last minute schedule that you have to complete? five minutes before you're going to sign the document. These issues do really need to be looked at first first step, don't they, in any organisation. They need to be kind of elevated to the top of the pile a bit more than they perhaps typically have been in, in agreements in the past, because it's really important to get your head around this early on, because you don't want it to be a blocker to signing an important agreement at the 11th hour. And that's, that's a, I think, a big point for me over the last 12 months as we've seen the Schrems uh, decisions emerging and then the Brexit issues as well. Really try to flush out what's going on right at the start. Yeah, I think it's become a, a more important aspect of your compliance infrastructure when it comes to data protection. It's something that, you know, historically, you know, people might have been inclined to just execute the standard contractual clauses, potentially not read them, but then you know, it's, it's a compliant transfer. You know, that kind of behaviour is not going to be um as easy in the future um so yeah i mean I, I agree with you i think it's something that's going to require more thought you know the standard contractual clauses whilst they're still available they are under scrutiny um, they survived trends too but potentially only because if they hadn't there wouldn't be any other way to get data out of the country um so yeah i mean with that scrutiny there's an additional compliance burden arguably so a bit more care due no, that's been great. Thank you very much, Christian. I've enjoyed talking to you about this. Um, some, some thorny issues, I think, around uh, data transfers. But you know, I hope I hope we've given you some practical tips to make your way through the minefield. Um, thank you once again for joining us. I hope you have found it useful, and hope to see you at our next webinar, which will be up very soon. Thank you, everybody.